day fifth, first to fifth day, but extending up to the seventh day, and also a few days before the symptoms occur. So I I put down in gray what I'm going to emphasize because if you look at this graph, uh, it's uh, if you're talking about a, an acutely symptomatic patient, the antibodies will not be detectable within the first uh, five days or seven days of the illness. So please remember this slide as we go. Next slide, please. So the first and most popular test that we know would be the molecular test. And with, when we talk about molecular tests, we're really talking about amplifying specific viral RNA fragments by nucleic acid amplification. These viral fragments can be viable or non-viable. And then talking again about the graph that we showed later, during recovery and at the later stage, we may really be talking about non-viable fragments, even though they're detectable by molecular tests. The fragments that various molecular tests like RT-PCR may be detecting may be any of these, ORF1A or uh, open reading frame 1B, the spike protein, RDE, and uh, the M protein and nuclear proteins. So depending on the RT-PCR test you're using, uh, it may be detecting any or some of these. Uh, the other kind of molecular test we have is the, sorry, this should be Expert Express. This is using the Expert platform, but instead of the Expert MTBR, M MTB RIF uh, cartridge, we're using Expert Express. That's a typo there. And there are two registered in the Philippines. And also in um, some um, developing countries, they do have already LAMP, which is an isothermal uh, amplification technique. This is uh, more useful in settings where you don't have the expert platform or you don't have the amplification machines for RT-PCR. Uh, but as far as I know, we, we don't have it here. Hopefully, we will have it. The testing time for these molecular tests will be anywhere between two to eight hours. It's faster with the Expert Express, but I also understand that some hospitals now are able to uh, have a turnaround time of one uh, of 12 hours for the RT-PCR test, which is good. But in general, the RT-PCR test has a turnaround time of anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. So much shorter for the Express uh, test, which is around two hours. Now, the analytical sensitivity of the molecular tests would be around 180 MDU. That's NAT. NAT stands for Nucleic Acid Amplification Test, detectable units from 180 to 600,000 MDU units per ml. So there's a very wide range in terms of the level of detection of the uh, RNA fragments. So depending on your RT-PCR test, it can be very sensitive. When we talk about analytical sensitivity, it's the ability to de detect the virus. While analytic specificity for most of these tests is around 100%, very specific. What does specificity, analytical specificity mean? It means the ability to detect only the SARS-CoV uh, CoV-2 virus and not other coronaviruses or other viruses. Now, this is very different from clinical sensitivity. When we talk about clinical sensitivity, this is really when it's already used in various uh, groups. The analytical sensitivity is mostly done in the labs and with the um, EUA in uh, the U.S., um, they they allow registration, FDA allows registration of the test, even though you just tested it on a panel of 30 positive and 30 negative COVID uh, samples, which is really very little. But when you talk about clinical sensitivity, the tests are done on uh, a various uh, 
hundreds of patients and a spectrum of patients uh, who may be suspect, who may be probable, who may be confirmed cases. So it's a mix of the real world. And when you talk about the real world clinical sensitivity, um, in a meta-analysis or systematic review by Floriano et al., they showed that the clinical sensitivity is much lower at 86%, with a 95% uh, confidence of interval 84 to 88. While uh, Deans et al., in their systematic review, identified as clinical sensitivity of 95.2%. However, it's important to note that this is just the pool sensitivity. The range actually was from 68% to 100% sensitivity. Again, a lot of variability among the different uh, molecular tests. In terms of the specificity, uniformly, the um, different molecular tests show fairly high specificity, 96% in the Floriano systematic review and 98.9% in the Deans et al. Uh, review. So, uh, quite high. Next, please. So, based on that, um, I'm pretty sure you're um, familiar with the recent omnibus interest guidelines that was issued by the Department of Health Memo 439. And of course, uh, these guidelines, um, PSMID is, uh, sits in the expert panel when these guidelines are developed. So they recommend that we, we use RT-PCR in um, prioritize subgroup A patients, those with severe and critical symptoms and with relevant history of travel and or contact. And the next priority would be individuals with mild symptoms and relevant history of travel and or contact and considered vulnerable. When we talk about vulnerable groups, these are elderly, those with pre-existing conditions that uh, will immunocom uh, are, uh, present uh, a immunocompromised state and uh, predispose them to severe presentations. Then uh, a third priority, lower priority, there will be individuals with mild symptoms and relevant history of travel and or contact. And uh, here, individuals uh, with no symptoms but with relevant history of travel and or contact or high risk of exposure are also candidates for RT-PCR. But again, this will be a lower priority. The real priority would be the symptomatic patients, groups A and B. And uh, the guidelines go up to group J. So I'm not going to go through the whole list of 10 groups. I'm just going to emphasize that the priority would really be groups A and B, and perhaps those with high risk uh, contact, okay? Next slide, please. The next group of tests would be the rapid antigen tests. There's a lot of talks about the antigen tests. Uh, the antigen tests diagnose acute inf infection, and most of these uh, rapid antigen tests are done by lateral flow immunoassay, where the samples really um, flow into the strips, and if uh, there's an antigen there, it binds to the antibody and produces a positive reaction with the two lines. And of course, if it's just uh, the control line, that's a negative reaction. This is fast and allows decentralized access to direct testing for SARS-CoV-2. The testing time is anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes only. And therefore, it's really a point of care uh, test that can be used. And some of the what we have in the Philippines are these lateral flow assays in strips, but in the U.S. they also have credit card type um, antigen tests already. So the analytic sensitivity of these tests, again, these are um, based on the application with FDA uh, using uh, specified uh, positive and negative specimens was very high, 96.5. 99.7 specificity, 
with rather a narrow 95% confidence interval. However, when you talk about clinical or real use uh, sensitivity in the real world, the sensitivity was very low at 49%, with a 95% confidence interval of 28 to 70%. This is uh, from a uh, rapid review of Dr. Bayona at Al uh, uh, 4H TAC. Dr. Bayona is from the Institute of Department of Clinical Epidemiology and um, uh, contributes to the HTAC rapid reviews for diagnostics. So uh, that's um, quite low. And for the systematic review by Dean et al., their estimate was 56.2%. So again, very low. And the range actually was from zero to 94%, depending on the kind of art rapid antigen tests that were being used. The clinical specificity, however, for most of the tests was uh, rather consistent at 99% and 99.5% in the two systematic reviews that uh, uh, I've cited. So um, here, because of the low sensitivity, it's important to note that a negative result does not rule out the possibility of SARS-CoV infection. Next slide. So based on those parameters, next slide, the interim omnibus guidelines of the DOH and based on the recommendations of the Health Technology Assessment uh, Council recommends RT-PCR only for asymptomatic patients, uh, sorry, only for symptomatic patients and for asymptomatic close contacts who fit the suspect case definition and probable case definition. This can be in the community or hospital setting uh, when RT-PCR capacity is insufficient. Right now, for example, in Region 5, the RT-PCR lab, lab there was destroyed by Typhoon Ro Roli. And therefore, it's uh, reasonable to think that an interim solution in that uh, situation would be to use the RT-PCR test but also the uh, DOH and WHO are trying to get uh, uh, logistics for transporting samples to the nearby regions for either express testing or RT-PCR. But in such conditions, really rapid antigen tests may have their use. And then of course, in the hospital setting where the turnaround turn around time is critical to guide patient cohort management, we can use rapid antigen tests. And of course, in the community during outbreaks, uh, for example, in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, where there are, where there are no RT-PCR tests and there's probably one or two express labs and there are uh, confirmed outbreaks there, it could be that you would use rapid antigen tests in that situation. But we have to note, again, because of the low sensitivity, that symptomatic close contacts who tested negative for antigen test, as well as asymptomatic cl close contacts, should undergo confirmatory RT-PCR, mainly because of the low sensitivity of the rapid antigen tests. Next, please. Now, um, next, please. The HTAC specifications, can you go back one slide, please? Uh, because of the variability of these tests, the HTAC specifies that when one chooses a rapid antigen test, uh, one should be quite sure that the sensitivity is at least 80% and the specificity is 97%. Uh, preferably using clinical sensitivity and specificity. In other words, not just the panel of 30 positives and 30 negatives, but also um, clinical sensitivity and specificity testing in real world situations. Um, next, please. The, in the Philippines, 
I think if we go back one slide, two slides back, sorry. There are um, 31 antigen tests already registered with the FDA. And I have to say again that the, the um, threshold for approval of the FDA is also like the emergency use approval in the US where they only have minimum standards, 30 positive and 30 negatives. So, but we do have a lot of those uh, rapid antigen tests available. I'd like to emphasize though that the HTAC recommendation is 80% sensitivity and 97% specificity. Okay, next please. And then um, if you talk about antibody tests, as I said, uh, we're not really going to emphasize the, this in this talk because these are really much more for surveillance purposes. Or if you want to uh, confirm uh, the diagnosis of a patient who you think is really uh, smells like COVID, looks like COVID, but the RT-PCR test is negative, you could perhaps uh, do an antibody test at the second or third week just to confirm retrospectively that this case is a really a uh, COVID case. No? So antibody tests in general uh, only indicate recent or past infection, but could be a confirmatory uh, retrospective uh, test. The platforms are usually lateral flow immunoassays, but the more reliable ones are the lab-based serological assays such as uh, CLIA, chemiluminescence immunoassays, or ELISA, enzyme-linked immunoassays, which can measure either Ig, total Ig, IgM, IgA, and or combinations of this and IgG. In the Philippines, we already have 99 rapid antibody tests and 65 immunoassays, lab-based immunoassays, as of October 30, 2020. Again, uh, like uh, the situation of rep emergency um, uh, use authorization. Uh, you will see here in the um, systematic review of Deeks and Al that the sensitivity, sensitivity of the antibody test differs based on the week that you use this test. If you use the test at the first week, your sensitivity is very dismal, 30%. At 8 to 14 weeks, it increases to 72%. But on the third and fourth weeks, the sensitivity of this test rises to over 90%. So that's about the time you want to use this test if you want to use it at all. For specificity, the specificity is uh, pretty good at 98.7%. Again, there's uh, some variability in terms of the timing of the test, but in general, it has a better specificity profile than the um, sensitivity. Next slide, please. I just like to show you that in terms of the different platforms, CLIA performs best in terms of the sensitivity, 97%, um, the CGIA 91%, ELISA 90%, and the lateral flow uh, much lower at 85%. Why is the lateral, fl lateral flow here 85%, whereas I showed you here it's 30%? Because this is a combination of the different tests over the different weeks, okay? Specificity is rather consistent over 90% for all the different antibody tests. Uh, that's all I'll say about the antibody tests. I'll move on. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello, next slide, please. Yeah, so now we've done the overview of the three main tests that we are using. By the way, for antibody tests, a very good test is neutralization assays. But as far as I know, we don't have that yet in the Philippines. With neutralization assays, you, it's very good to use for determining um, who is good for uh, plasma convalescent uh, don uh, donation. And uh, so uh, let's look out for neutralization tests as they come. And I hope our scientists in the Philippines are able to develop 
these neutralization tests in the future. Now, the caveats for the first two tests that we are talking about is, of course, dependent on the test that you performed, whether it's RT-PCR. I talked about the caveats of RT-PCR. If you do it beyond two to three weeks and it's still positive, it doesn't mean that the patient is really infectious. If you do the RT, the rapid antigen test beyond the first week, it's negative. It doesn't mean that that patient didn't have uh, COVID, it, it's just that it was wrong timing. Or if you did it with an asymptomatic patient where the sensitivity is pretty low, then, uh, then you run into a pitfall of telling the patient he's negative, but in fact, it's just the sensitivity of the patient uh, of the test being low. Uh, I'm not going to uh, antibody tests right now. We already said what, when, when you can use antibody tests. And I already explained the difference between analytical accuracy and clinical accuracy. So when you talk to the uh, those the suppliers and they show you the brochure, it's usually the analytical accuracy that they will present to you. Ask for the clinical sensitivity specificity results in relation to the tests that they use, because there's a big difference when you talk about analytical and clinical accuracy. One I'd like to talk about specifically is um, when you talk about these tests, you have to be uh, have an estimate of the pretest probability of having SARS-CoV uh, infection because this matters in interpreting the test. Let's go to the next slide, please. So, uh, just to remind you, what is sensitivity specificity? Specificity. We've been talking about this in um, the two by two table. The gold standard. Uh, it's usually RT-PCR, but the really, really gold standard would be uh, viral culture. But uh, for practical purposes, RT-PCR is the gold standard. And here we have the rapid antigen test. If uh, you have A over A plus C, we're talking about sensitivity. D over D plus, uh, D, plus D is specificity. And uh, of course, you have the false positives here, C, and the false uh, uh, false negatives here uh, would be C, and the false positives would be B. But there's also the positive predictive value, which depends on the pretest probability that you have that this patient has the disease. Uh, and of course, there's likelihood ratio. What's the likelihood that the patient has the disease when you have the result? Let's look at that more carefully in the next slide. If you have this two by two table and you don't want to do your calculations uh, by the bedside, you, you can go to this website, for example, or some apps on your, on your mobile phone. Let's uh, please click on this uh, website. This is the Vassar College website. And here, um, Let's say the prevalence or what we would call in uh, individual clinical diagnostic test. Let's say you're not sure whether this symptomatic patient has COVID or not COVID because it's just cough or itchy throat. Let's put the pretest probability as 0.50 or 50%. And let's say that you have a good rapid antigen test that has the H stack specification of 80% and specificity of 97%. If you calculate the post-test probability uh, of that patient, the positive predictive value of having the disease is 96%. Why? Because the specificity is very high, 97%. So even in a patient where you're 50-50, but this patient is symptomatic, by the use of a rapid antigen test, you're pretty sure that this patient probably has COVID, okay? 96% sure. But if the patient tests to be, is uh, negative uh, on this test, um, the negative predictive value is lower at 82%. So you're not sure. Sorry, Marami uh, Pa, sorry, yes. Then the likelihood ratio is around 26% for 26 times more likely that this patient is positive. Next slide. 
uh, a few more. Yes, siguro three more. Tawad lang. Next, please. No problem, ma'am. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, let's proceed then to the next slide. Um, please move on. Next, please. Na, bumalik tayo. Okay, here. You will look at this patient. This is uh, somebody who has a pretest probability of 80%. You have a patient who probably has some dyspnea already, cough, fever, etc. You're pretty sure uh, this is probable COVID. You do the rapid antigen test with these kinds of accuracy parameters. The likelihood that this patient has uh, the the predictive value of this patient, positive predictive value is 99%, and the likelihood uh, ratio for a positive test is 100 times, 106 times more likely that he has COVID. And the negative test, uh, well, if you have a negative test on the rat, it's 54% uh, the likelihood that uh, this is a negative test. However, look at the next scenario. The next scenario is a pretest probability of 0.05. For example, a patient just came to you and said, Doc, gusto ko talaga malaman kung meron akong COVID o wala. Uh, but no, no exposure, no uh, to a positive uh, individual. So let's take the pretest probability of five percent with the same parameters of the rapid antigen test. What happens? You will see that the likelihood uh, that this patient has SARS-CoV is fifty-eight percent. In other words, it's more like flipping the coin fifty-fifty uh, with that. Sayang lang yung rapid antigen test mo in that situation. However, the negative predictive value is very high in that situation. If you have a negative test in that kind of patient who has a 0.05 pretest probability, uh, then this patient uh, probably has no uh, COVID. So, very different scenarios, very different pretest probabilities. But the interpretation will be very different, so be very careful. In this situation, be very careful about false positive results because you have a pretest probability of 5%. Don't tell the patient that because he has a positive test here in this situation with pretest probability of 5%, don't scare him and say you have COVID. Ask him to do a confirmatory test. Here, you will do a confirmatory test if the uh, patient turns out to have a negative test. But here, if you have a positive test, ask for a confirmatory RT-PCR test. Okay, those are the pitfalls you have to watch out for. Next slide, please. The other ones that uh, I'd like to discuss very rapidly are the tests will vary because of the way the sample was collected, how it is collected, laboratory errors. And I already talked about the very big variability among the different tests marketed. Uh, next slide, slide, please. Here, I'll show you that uh, the kinds of samples yet that you collect will have very different uh, sensitivity, although the specificity will be high. For example, with saliva, is being said to have some uh, fairly good sensitivity, but uh, different tests still show a lot of variability. So watch out for that as it's uh, improved further. Next, please. Um, next. Of course, the sampling, the collection, the storage will affect how the RPTR, RT-PCR will perform. Even a uh, rapid antigen test, the way you collect and uh, process the specimen might affect your tests. So you have to be sure. If you're not sure about your lab for RT-PCR, uh, maybe you sh should try some other lab because uh, there you might get another result. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, I'm just trying to show here the very big variability. Um, the uh, first price goes to somebody who is able to reduce this kind of variability with a panel of RTPR samples uh, shown to various labs here. And yet, the different CT values range from this high, this low, to this high. 
So be very careful about this kind of variability among the RT-PCR results. Here in the Philippines, uh, next please. Uh, the licensed RT-PCR um, labs in the Philippines are 118. And uh, I can assure you that the R RITM, this is also from RITM, probably does not have the human resources to test the quality controls uh, procedures of all these labs. So watch out for that. Uh, some labs may be contaminated. Some may have poor, uh, lower uh, detection limits. And then um, there are 36 labs with expert-based uh, um, detection systems. Next, please. Next, please. So what do we do in the face of imperfect tests? There is value in repeat testing, as I already mentioned, that if you have high suspicion for COVID and the RT-PCR is negative, you may repeat the RT-PCR because it could be positive as it goes towards the peak. And if you have high suspicion for lower respiratory tract infection, you might want to repeat it, but using lower tract samples. If you have a low suspicion, but was tested for RT-PCR and it's still negative, don't repeat it. Uh, there's also value in sequential testing for rapid antigen tests uh, uh, in the scenarios that I already that already painted earlier. Next, please. And finally, my uh, second to the last slide is ju just to tell you, uh, in the monitoring and the surveillance of exposed HCWs, um, there is now talk. The HTAC has not made a recommendation on this. They're still saying we need more research on this. But if you just choose an expensive RT-PCR test, but you test it very infrequently because it's so expensive, you may miss that window where you really have a high viral load. So you test it here, it's negative. You test it here, it's positive. The orange uh, circle is positive, but he's probably no longer infectious here, okay? But if you do a a cheaper test, but you can do it more frequently, then it's more likely that you will catch the healthcare worker at a stage that um, he's positive while the viral load is still positive. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. Uh, when you do rapid antigen tests and it's positive in, of course, uh, exposed uh, H healthcare workers or symptomatic individuals, the likelihood that the antigen will be positive is in this window. But here, RT-PCR, you may not really be testing infectious individuals. Next, please. And therefore, with all these uh, interpretation um, cautions, that's the wisdom behind the obvious guidelines that the different COVID tests must be correlated with the clinical picture of the patient and must be interpreted by licensed physicians who know what they're talking about. And uh, I really uh, appreciate that uh, many of you here are interested in uh, this session because it will help you really um, avoid the pitfalls and interpret your tests more um, correctly. Thank you, Des, for your patience. Over. Hi, ma'am. Magandang gabi po. Oh, thank you for that very comprehensive and enlightening talk. May I request uh, our host to call in, ipasok sa frame yung our panelists. Oh, and while we are doing that, oh, and maybe to give Dr. Lansang a few seconds to rest, let me remind everyone that, again, this is a four-part webinar series from PSMID. Tomorrow, we will have another webinar. That's webinar O. It's COVID-19 testing in the workplace, turning office blues to office gold. And then on November 5, we have webinar L, recrossing borders, testing and quarantine guidelines for the Filipino travelers. And finally, on Friday, we have D. D for deliverance, living a safer normal with COVID-19. So everyone is invited to join all of those webinars. Yun pong remaining three webinars natin, 
they are going to be broadcasted live sa Facebook page ng PISMID. So, there's not going to be any registration required. All right, are the panelists in the frame already? Wala pa. So, I'd like to invite everyone to type in your questions or comments sa chat box po. But while you are thinking of your own questions, let me start the ball rolling. Ako naman po yung moderator, eh, di ba? So I think I have this privilege to, to throw in the first question. Uh, quick question lang po. Uh, ano pong specimen yung best na isend? Oo, para pinakamataas po yung sus, uh, sensitivity and the possibility of detecting COVID-19 in a symptomatic patient. Is it NPS, UPS, both NPS, OPS, or a lower respiratory tract specimen? Uh, do I have uh, Dr. Panaligan? Okay. I am not sure if I am the one having the, the technical problem. Oh. Uh, Dr. Panaligan, can you hear me? Oh. Or can somebody from the panelists uh, acknowledge if they are hearing yes, me? Yes, Doc, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh oh. Yeah, so I'm seeing Dr. Panaligan. Again, our panelists include Dr. Lansang, Dr. Jimmy Montoya from PCHRD, Dr. Mario Panaligan, past president of PISMID, and now the president of PCP. And we have the current president of uh, the PSMID, Dr. Marisa Alejandria. So maybe Dr. Panaligan can answer the first question. Ano po yung best specimen to send? Yeah. Uh Thank you, Des. Uh, uh, certainly, based on the lecture of Dr. Lasang. By the way, thank you, Mama. Salamat po. Maraming salamat sa napagandang lecture. Uh, but of course, based on one of her slides, you know, uh, I think she mentioned that the best sample is the lower respiratory tract you know, samples. But certainly, in our last guidelines, updated last July, certainly we recommend nasopharyngeal uh, swab specimen. But of course, in most cases, we still use the combined samples, both the nasopharyngeal and the oropharyngeal swabs. So, but certainly, uh, the bronchoalveolar lavage as well as the sputum samples are better. They provide higher yield no, of a positive result for the PCR. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, mga ma'am and mga sir, I, I have here uh, an example of a rapid test, a rapid antibody test dito po sa, sa clinic. I know that uh, si Dr. Lansang told us that the pulled sensitivity po of the rapid antibody test, it's at 49% or maybe 50%. Okay. Now, others would argue that even if that sensitivity is low, you still get that 50% and that benefit is good enough. How do we address this concern? What are the dangers of using tests with low sensitivity, such as yung rapid antibody test? Maybe Ma'am Isa can, can answer the question. Ano po yung dangers kapag pinilit po natin gamitin yung mga tests na ang baba ng sensitivity? Okay. Thank you, Desi. And thank you, Dr. Lansang, for the very informative and comprehensive lecture. Uh, yes, uh, so for rapid antibody tests, uh, Dr. Lansang showed us that there is a wide range you know, of sensitivity and of sensitivity for uh, rapid antibody tests. The specificity is almost the same. No, it's good for all the rapid antibody tests. So my comment here is that if you really want to use a rapid antibody test, let's choose the one. That has a high sensitivity. Says so uh, the requirement, no, HTAC, actually, the requirement for rapid antibody is at least 90% sensitivity. So there are rapid antibody tests that have a good sensitivity. Now, the danger of using or the pitfall of using uh, rapid antibody tests with low sensitivity, as you mentioned, is you get a false negative. Diba? 
So yes, Paul. Yeah, that false sense of security that you do not have the infection. And if you remember the graph that Dr. Ansam showed, if you want to detect the disease, if you you want to know the disease, if you have the infection, then you have to do it during the first week of illness. And we saw that the performance of rapid antibody test is best on the third week. So you will miss out. There's the possibility that you are incubating or you have the virus already, but you are negative if you do a rapid antibody test. So that's you have the possibility of having a false negative result and the consequence is uh, you can infect uh, someone else no? if you don't practice the uh, public health measures. Yeah, po. So, mahalaga na ano na kailangan yung minimum health standards in terms of preventing yung getting COVID-19 in the community, yung hand hygiene, face shield, surgical mask, and physical distancing po. Now, I don't want us to deal so much on antibody tests. So, maybe the last question on antibody tests, can it be used daw po as a means to detect non-infectiousness? Is it fair to assume that a patient with a positive IgG is already non-infectious? Quick answer, Ma'am Isa, siguro, since nasagot mo na yung earlier question. Yes, uh, we can use it to complement, no? uh, to confirm whether you had exposure no? to the infection already. So if you develop antibodies already, then yes, we can use the patient consider them non-infectious already. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, ganito po, meron kasing scenario na meron daw isang seaman na, na paalis, so he was cleared to, to, to leave the Philippines kasi negative export, nag-RT-PCR uli, positive na. So, how, how do we interpret those types of results now it seems that it's disconcordant maybe dr montoya can help us if that's okay with him or maybe any other pa uh, panelist uh, sir dr montoya i think you're muted thank you yeah. thanks for that question i will attempt to answer the question uh, I thought for a while that the lecturer is the one who answered the question and we will just be reacting to her talk. But anyway, having said that, my immediate answer there is, are we talking of the same test? Are we talking of the same uh, environment in which the test was done? My understanding is uh, maybe, and I just my, my suspicion is, there are two different tests. It is very hard to compare two different tests done at two different time intervals. Correct. And in this situation, the only advice I can give is you rely on your clinical uh, acumen. If you really think that uh, maybe if it's asymptomatic, then you go either way. Uh, and I leave that to the doctor to make the judgment. But I cannot... Uh, you know, I cannot even uh, speculate on uh, wh why the results are discordant, especially if it's in a matter of what, 24 days, uh, 24 hours, I suppose, or the same day. Uh, I can only say that maybe one of them is wrong. <laughs> I don't know which one of them is wrong. So I, it will depend really on the... Opo. And that's uh -oh. that's the as far as Although, I can go. Maybe I, I think, sir, can, it's really can hard. Be more, uh, no. uh, uh, oh, and oh. also, as I mentioned in the caveats and pitfalls, uh, Jimmy very right. The difference in labs can uh, do that, but also the uh, the way the sample was collected. You know, if they were rushing at the airport, did not collect the sample very well, it could uh, very well be negative. Uh, things like that, the variables that we should consider. Yeah, I think, Mom, you have a slide there, no? Trying to explain some of the factors that really affect the results of the different tests that we have. 
Opo. So it's not just, it's not as easy as saying one is false positive and the other is false negative. Marami talagang factors na kailangan i-consider. Or the seaman was exposed, kasi di ba, from one... In transit. In transit. <laughs> In transit. Opo. Opo. Okay, ma'am, next question po. Before kasi during the start of the, the pandemic, ang, ang advice was kapag si, uh, mild yung symptoms, tapos wala namang comorbidities, but you have fever, you have cough, uh, you just stay at home, tapos no need for testing. At this point kasi ma'am, mas marami na pong available na, na molecular laboratory tests. Ibig sabihin, mas accessible na. What is the current recommendation right now? Should all symptomatics be tested already, whether mild or whether may comorbidity sila or wala? Uh, sino po kaya? Ma'am Isa? Ah, sige. Yeah. Uh, yes, during the early part of the pandemic, we were not testing everyone, di ba? Because of the uh, limitations in access. But with the, if you remember the omnibus guidelines presented uh, by Dr. Lansang, so we already uh, categorized there the priority groups. So yung severe, critical, then I think subgroup C, yung mild, no? We can all test them. Kasi, uh, it's uh, it has value because the pandemic is still ongoing, so we want to know really the numbers, no, where we are as far as uh, the control of the pandemic is in the country. So, and plus, uh, it also helps in contact tracing. Thank you, ma'am. Now, uh, I, there are a lot of recovered patients from COVID-19 already, di ba? Mas marami naman talaga nagre-recover compared dun sa nag expire But the problem is we really have a hard time really advising them that they can be reintegrated into the community kasi yung iba sa kanila persistently positive yung RT-PCR and ang nagiging impression ko ay marami mga tao talaga parang ginagawa nilang ano, uh, they equate yung RT-PCR as a test of, of cure and infectiousness or non-infectiousness as at that. Uh, what can you can you comment about this po? Should R, an RT-PCR be negative talaga para sabihin natin i-discontinue yung isolation of a COVID-19 infected patient? Uh, Doc Mario? Yeah. Um, thank you, Ado, sa tanong. Si marami may ganyan talaga. Okay, just just ask clearance no whether the patient can undergo like, surgery no uh ang problema nung repeat nga yung kanyang PCR test positive but definitely I gave the clearance no to uh, have her undergo the surgery but in most cases kasi when we talk about clearance for work or for something else no na dapat talaga magsigurado yung patient na negative talaga sa PCR uh it's just unfortunate that it's very hard no to uh for others to believe that these patients are no longer infectious, particularly if they have uh, uh, recovered, meaning they don't have, they don't have any symptom or they just had mild infection and after 10 to 14 days, na wala na yung mga sakit, no? And therefore, it's, it's part of our guidelines that we no longer recommend repeating the PCR. But again, it's unfortunate for some workplaces or for some other procedures, for example, the surgery, they still require, of course, doing the RT PCR. And, and sometimes uh, we just have to, uh, again, convince those people that these patients may just have uh, fragments, as discussed earlier by Dr. Lansang, no? viral fragments that can be still detected with the PCR. And therefore, um, most of the time, they're no longer infectious because they're not carrying the viable virus already. So, mas tama lang dapat talaga, consider na silang non infectious. Eh. Sir, totoo po po na, na past 10 days from the onset of illness, even if detectable yung, or positive yung RT-PCR, hindi na infectious yung, ano, yung, yung patient and the viral particles are actually dead already. Totoo po ba? That's correct. Uh, in, most, uh, in most cohorts no, na, na discussed in WHO as early as 20, uh, May, no? May 2020, they have released that guideline, so updated guideline saying that after 10 days, Beyond 10 days, of course, they're no longer infectious and they don't carry the viable uh, virus. You know? and, and therefore, RT-PCR is no longer necessary to be repeated. You know? Because, of course, we're, we're, when we talk about the, the test itself, you know, it's not cheap. 
and certainly if we can actually conserve this uh, test no, for others who, who need the test, definitely we will uh, focus more on those who are actively infectious or those who can actually transmit the virus to other people. So again, in most cases or in most cohorts no, that have been studied, no, beyond 10 days, the, the virus is no longer viable. Yeah. May I Thanks. add something to that, uh, Des? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, um, in general, uh, that's that's correct, except maybe for critically ill and severe patients who, where uh, the patient might still be infectious be, uh, up to three weeks, etc. So uh, just to be careful with that group. And also, one gauge that some clinicians uh, uh, have been doing is to look at the CT value, the cycle threshold of the RT-PCR test. And if it's uh, uh, still low, let's say 24, 18, that patient is probably infectious. And if it's about 30, 34, it, probably that's uh, just uh, fragments of non-viable um, um, SARS-CoV. However, I would like to stress, this is not a major recommendation. There needs to be uh, more evidence because um, the pathologists especially say that the variability in the level of detection among labs is very great and even among different RT-PCR tests so that you may be saying that the CT value is like this, whereas in another lab, the CT value might be higher. So it's very difficult to put a precise cutoff value to say it's not infectious. But in general, a higher one, uh, probably the fragments are non-viable. Over, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there's a question here. Uh -oh. uh, hi, Doc. Thank you for the very informative lecture. I just didn't get the testing of exposed healthcare workers the last graph of Dr. Lansang. Can you explain this again? Uh, sorry, I was in a rush kasi uh, yung timer ni Des eh. uh, Can we show that slide again so I can uh, kind of explain it a bit more? Yes, please. So we're talking about two scenarios here of surveillance, two modes of surveillance for healthcare workers. And one is the expensive RT-PCR test. Move back a little. Um, slide 25. Yeah. So uh, remember this, this curve I showed you about um, the pre-symptomatic phase, then your viral load goes up, then your viral load goes down, but your RT-PCR can still be positive. If you do just an RT-PCR, if your hospital thinks that to do the surveillance of your healthcare workers, just do uh, RT-PCR once every two weeks, if you can afford. If you do that, uh, this, these open circles mean negative, okay? And if you do it maybe after two weeks, again, maybe you can catch that healthcare worker and he's positive. But remember that the RT-PCR test can be positive anywhere from the pre-symptomatic phase up to three, four weeks or even beyond. So just doing RT-PCR uh, very infrequently, we might catch him not infectious phase, but already in the phase uh, where he's not infectious. Whereas if you do the rapid antigen test, but you do it frequently because it's uh, quite cheap and reasonable. Um, it may be negative here, despite his exposure in the wards, etc. And suddenly he becomes positive. And we know that he's a uh, high risk for exposure. This will be really quite suggestive of a positive uh, COVID uh, healthcare worker. Uh, if you did it here, and it's uh, positive, then uh, that's the viral load. May uh, It's negative here. He's in the pre-symptomatic phase, may still be negative. But if you repeat it quite frequently, you may catch him in that infectious phase. Okay? 
And compared to the RT-CPR, uh, RT-PCR, what's the advantage? If you do it here in a high-risk healthcare worker, you are quite sure that this is during the first week of illness because it will become negative here. Whereas the RT-PCR will still be positive here and yet he has gone beyond the infectious stage. That's what I mean. I hope that's uh, clearer now. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mark. Again, I have to say that this is not a stand yet of HTAC or DOH. This is undergoing um, validation, but uh, some of those scientists who have proposed this are, for example, an eminent scientist in Harvard, Dr. Barry Bloom, he's a professor emeritus there, and others like uh, Mina and Al. Over. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We'll, we'll be asking the last two questions. Number second, second to the last is all about the CT value. So, meron pong nagtatanong dito, can you explain the utility of the CT value in the interpretation of RT-PCR result? And would you suggest reporting the CT values for better management of positive patients? Uh, any, anyone from the panelists can answer the question po. Uh, I, I think that's already, yeah, I think that was already answered by Dr. Lansang. But let me just add that uh, before you can actually use CT values, it has to be standardized. It has to be standardized based on the machine that's used, based on the method that's actually used, and the kit that is actually used. So it's actually kit dependent, if I should say. And only within that kit can you actually generate a range of CT values that maybe, I say maybe, suggest whether uh, or uh, give an idea of the quantity or the viral load is actually present in the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Apo. Two related questions, po. This is from Dr. Alex Bellio. In the omnibus interim guidelines, rapid antigen test is indicated for high risk, high index of suspicion cases and not for asymptomatics. But how come a patient with high risk exposure to COVID-19 patient, pero asymptomatic, asymptomatic, can be tested using your rapid antigen test? Why not use RT-PCR to screen this asymptomatic patient with high risk exposure? Salamat po. Okay. I think the guidelines is uh, recommending rapid antigen tests as an alternative if there is no uh, access or limited access to RT PCR. So in this situation, in this situation, you can actually RT PCR is also Recommend then no, to screen the symptomatic sure. But remember the graph of Dr. Lansang, no? you might catch that patient depending on the timing of exposure, you know, whether that patient is already on the uh, towards the latter part of the infection, asymptomatic phase, or in the first part. So in this setting, you can actually do both. You can use RT-PCR, you can use rapid antigen. Kung rapid antigen naman at negative, you can do a repeat. It's what the uh, drug is saying, you know, that you can repeat and still catch it if that patient is in the first week of uh, illness. So I, I'd like to add to uh, what Dr. Isa just said. Uh, I'd like to refer again to the clinician's judgment of the pretest probability of the patient. If the patient had high risk exposure to a confirmed individual, the pretest probability, even though it's asymptomatic, might be high. Could be 30%, could be 40% or 50%. So there's still value in doing the rapid antigen test as long as you know how to interpret the post test probability. And Actually, HTAC says that um, if you've been exposed, you can do the rapid uh, antigen test between four to 11 days after the exposure because that's the probable window where 
the um, virus is um, slowly building up in terms of the load. Over, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And since we're talking about asymptomatic contacts, last question. Uh, you very po kasi concerned about pre-symptomatics and asymptomatic COVID-19 patients. Is there any way, any best test to identify them? Like. Oh, uh, should, yes, hello, yes, sir. Yeah, there's, uh, of course, most of the asymptomatics, certainly, uh, when when tested, they are most of the time negative, no? Uh, primarily because, of course, the number of the virus or the, the viral load is low. And, and therefore, um, in, in most, most of the time, we don't actually do it or don't test them, but just observe them, no? And I think what we have recommended before is to still continue with the 14 day screening test uh, so that we can just observe them if just in case they got exposed or there is really no significant exposure, for example, and yet they're just bothered because they just got uh, some something, for example, uh, got uh, reported, reported to have exposed in a restaurant, for example, when there's really so minimal contact or the duration of exposure is less than 15 minutes. And therefore, when they ask you and wala naman silang symptoms, so they can, they can just observe, they can just advise them to observe themselves, monitoring for signs of symptoms to develop within the next 14 days. Uh, again, I have to go back to what I said. No? So most asymptomatic patients among, usually are negative when we do the PCR test. And again, if we do the rapid antigen test, we don't recommend it for asymptomatic individuals, especially if there's no significant contact. Yeah, and then second, of course, uh, I, I also would like to emphasize what Dr. Lansang mentioned earlier. No, We really need to go clinical, uh, have that, um, and, and make adjustment based on the previous probability of having COVID-19 before we even do the test, uh, like for example, the antigen test or even the PCR test. Sir, Opo. I I think we we're supposed to end at seven o'clock, but syempre hindi naman natin papabayaan na hindi it take advantage yung ating powerhouse panelist and speaker. But uh, before we end, I would like to request each of our panelists to just provide us with one or two sentences as a final message before we end. Mm -hmm. Montoya? Okay, one or two statements. I'd like to thank everyone, especially Dr. Lansang for that very comprehensive lecture. I should say that all of the tests, how useful they are, will vary as we move across time. And as more new tests are developed, maybe more sensitive, more specific, we can have newer recommendations. But at the end of the day, regardless of what the results are, Clinical test probability, as was mentioned by Dr. Lansang, does matter. Learned in medical school that you know you only use the tests to support your suspicion. Diba? I mean, if, if you do not really suspect that the patient is such, but the tests reveal otherwise, unless it is actually 100% sensitive with very high specificity, then I still will go with your clinical judgment. But I assume. But for an infectious disease like uh, COVID-19, it's better to err on the safe side, which is really to assume that the patient is infected so that you will actually institute the proper quarantine and isolation measures until such time to prove the patient to be truly negative. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Amal Isa. Yeah, okay. Again, thank you to Dr. Lansang and thank you, thank you also, Dr. Montoya, for, ta for taking time to be part of the panel. Of course, Mario. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah.
Sak uh, last words. Sa akin to optimize the use of the diagnostic test, no. So yun, we have to remember the when to request the test, no. So yung appropriate timing. And uh, ito yung like I always say this: we treat the patient, not the lab result. So we always have to correlate with the clinical history, the symptoms, the exposure history. Yung details, yung timing, onset of symptoms, and details on exposure history. So that we can formulate our pretest probability. And that will guide us in how we are going to interpret the test. No? And sa in infectious diseases, no, when uh, the test results uh, apply not only to our patient that is in front of us, but also the family and the community. So, kasi... We have to do contact tracing and then uh, our advice on preventive measures. We have to check who among the family members also have symptoms. So uh, we diagnose not just the patient, but also the family and the community. And that is where we need to use uh, the test wisely. So appropriate test for the right timing and for the right uh, patient. So for diagnosis, it's PCR for clinical diagnosis, and it's a uh, specificity that matters there. And then for screening, where we do, where we test the uh, asymptomatic patient, sensitivity are uh, more important. Unfortunately, our tests are limited in terms of sensitivity. So, and then rapid antibody test is not cannot be used as standalone for diagnosis. It is only to confirm if the patient had an infection. Thank. You. Yeah. Thank. You. Thank you, Ma'am Isa. Uh, Doc Mario. Yeah. Des. Uh, una una. Salamat po kay Dr. Lansang. No. Uh, ganda. And we definitely learn a lot. And I'm happy to be part of the panel. No. And following two of my mentors, of course, Dr. Ramon Poya my training officer then and of course my colleague no trainer mentor ko yan si Isa sa research same as Dr. Lansang no kada lang mentors ko sino no and sabi mo kayo na one to two sentences lang mahaba na yung sinabi nila eh. and following my mentors of course I will just follow what they said no? uh certainly clinical acumen should always be maintained particularly when we talk about diagnostic tests no we should never be happy learning that there's a new test that will be available for as long but because we need to know how, when to use it, and how we're going to interpret the results. No? Kasi importante, malaman din natin kung para saan yung test at kung kailan natin siya gagamitin at paano makakatulong sa pasyente natin. So I think that's, I think, very, very crucial no? when we decide on doing a test, when to do it, and for how, or for what, what the purpose. Uh, kasi importante yung malaman natin kaysa gumasos tayo and yet it's, gonna, it's not going to be useful. And certainly, what's, what's more important is, of course, we really need to learn how to protect ourselves, no? including, of course, those patients who are infected, as well as the family, as well as the community members. Yeah, thank you. Salamat. Thank you, sir. And finally, Dr. Sang, for your message. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, PSMID, Dr. Alejandria, Dr. Montoya, Dr. Paniligan, and of course, our a handsome moderator, Dr. Roman. Um, all I want to say is uh, please stay tuned. Science develops fast. What I'm saying today may be different tomorrow. Uh, there may be new tests, new developments and discoveries. So stay tuned and um, be critical about what you read. And most important, uh, be confident about your clinical judgments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you po sa ating ano, sa ating powerhouse panelists. So, ang natutunan ko po ngayong gabi, alam naman natin na yung mention pa lang ng world na COVID-19 gives anxiety to 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 everyone. And so, when we whenever we request this test, hindi pwedeng just just lang or just because kaya natin gagawin yung mga test. There has to be a wisdom on why we are doing the test and also Hopefully, because of this webinar, we have prepared you on how to interpret interpret these tests that are available. So, thank you everyone. Yung maximum na number of participants po natin, umabot tayo ng mga 600 
38, if I'm not mistaken. And right now we have still 534 participants. I'd like to thank once again MSD, MSD for providing us with the platform for this webinars. Meron po ulit available or uh, meron tayong webinar bukas via the Facebook Facebook tomorrow sa Makalawa and sa Friday. Libre po yun, no need for registration. And again, it's 29 days before the PISMID anniversary. So it's going to be celebrated by a virtual convention, December 1 to 5. Mark your calendars. Registration is free po. Okay? Maraming salamat po and have a safe night. Thank Mula you. Picture Good night. Thank you. My picture taking. Picture <laughs> taking. Uh, yes. Picture Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sama ako. <laughs> Once in a lifetime mangyari ito, Dok. Sorry. Yan, sasama din ako. Doktora, ha? <laughs> so, <laughs> parang may bragging rights ako sa office namin. <laughs> ah. Yan. Uy, may audience pa. Okay, Dok. One. Yan po. One, two, three.